Okay, so I'd like to start the webinar. So thank you for coming to this webinar tonight. And uh, this webinar is Elsa OP and the JSS joint webinar. So I would like to show the agenda of the webinar tonight. So David, will you show? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me see. Can you see? Yeah, I can see, but it's a window is very small. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Thank you, thank you. So, the theme of this webinar is Asian bariatric and metabolic surgery. Dr. Mahia Osman from Turkey, and I, Kazuri Kasama from Japan, is the moderators of these webinars. Tonight. We have four esteemed guests from JSS and ERSA. Dr. Ota and Dr. Seki from JSS and Dr. Shabir and Dr. Prasad from India. And the end of this webinar, we will have some discussion. So if you guys have some uh, question, please don't be, please don't hesitate to write in a box or chat. And uh, I would like to ask you that the, all panelists and the speakers, please keep the microphone mute when not talking. And all participants are encouraged to ask questions through the Q and A. And the moderator will control the flow and timing of the presentation. And uh, we need to tell you that this webinar is recorded and uploaded on ERSA YouTube channel. And uh, this webinar is broadcasted over Facebook of ERSA. And end of the session, there will be a Q&A discussion. And I also need to tell you that the next ERSA Congress this year, this will be in Dubai, UAE and the 21st to 23rd October. Please save the data and join our program in Dubai. So I would like to start this webinar from my uh, brief talking about Asian metabolic and the bariatric surgery. So I would like to show my uh, screen, share my screen. Okay, so that uh, this is a brief lecture of why Asia needs Asian bariatric and the metabolic surgery. Many of you know that obesity rising all over the world. Even in, Asia, even in Asia, we have China, India, and Pakistan, and Indonesia. So huge uh, population country in Asia. So that the obesity is rising all over the world, even in Asia. But when talking about the ratio of obesity, Asia has less obesity ratio than other parts of the world. So this is the obesity ratio at OECD countries. As you can see here, Asia occupies the lower part of the ratio. Of course, the United States has a very high part, uh, high uh, percentage of the obesity. The average is around 20%. In the world. But we need to talk about uh, diabetes. As you can see here, the, the Australia and the Middle East and the United States has a very high rate of obesity. But uh, diabetes is almost 10% even in the high rate of obesity country or even in Asia. 
including Japan and Singapore. And the many positives of uh, Asia has higher rate of diabetes, diabetes than the obesity. So when we talk about the diabetes worldwide, 60% of diabetes patients are in Asia. So the mean BMI among type two diabetes patients is quite different. In China, Japan, it's, it's uh, 24 or 23 BMI, but in United States, the mean BMI of the diabetic people is more than 30. So that means in Western country, obese people tend to be diabetic, but in Asia, non-obese people is also diabetic. And the, in Asia, we have a clinical phenotype, which means that uh, Asian people tend to have a young onset diabetes. Young onset diabetes is diagnosis younger than 40 years old. So this is a very nice program among Asia. So in Asia, around 20% of the diabetes patients are young onset diabetes. This is quite different from Western country. In Western country, young onset diabetes is less than 10%. And because of such kind of young onset diabetes, the uh, Asian tend to have tend to uh, tend Asian have a tendency to die younger. So this is a uh, number of diabetes patients age of death in our country, like uh, West Pacific and uh, Southeast Asia, has a uh, the diabetes patients die young in Asia. It's quite different from other parts. So that for Asian, diabetes is a bigger burden than obesity. So that the metabolic surgery is uh, more important than bariatric <laughs> surgery in Asia. And also we cannot forget the gastric cancer. More than 50% of the gastric cancer worldwide are from Asia. So that I think it's very important. It is very important of Asian evidence for metabolic surgery. So that I always say that the metabolic surgery by Asian surgeons for Asian patients with Asian evidence. So tonight, my colleague will talk about uh, uh, bariatric metabolic surgery in Asia with Asian evidence. Please enjoy our webinar. Thank you so much. I hope many of you understand the situation in Asia. And the first speaker is a Dr. Author, and he talks about the situation in Asia metabolic and bariatric surgery. So please start your presentation, Dr. Oder. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Kasama, for your uh, introdu uh, in my introduction, I'm honored to have the opportunity to present my paper in this webinar. I will start my video.
sorry, Dr. Aota, to interrupt you. The volume is very low. Very low? Uh, very low. I cannot hear your voice. Emma. That's good, thank you. Sorry, Emma, we still have problem of hearing. Sorry, doctor, to interrupt you. We cannot hear you, so can you do it live? It, it... The main procedure into Thank you. 
patient with more than 37.5 BMI, regardless of the level of glycemic control, and with 32.5 to 37.5 BMI, and in adequate surgery should also be considered to be an option in patient with 27.5 so professor kasama sure uh, I should yeah. please start again. Uh, yeah. Please yes. do so, so that, uh, yeah. So we cannot hear your voice on video, so that it's better to do it live. Okay. So you, you can skip some, some slides that uh, you think is the important slide. Uh -huh. You should check it. Yeah. It's up to you. But uh, I'd like to hear your lecture of the current status so that the bridge starts again. Okay. If you can. Okay. Maybe. Uh... Yeah, please skip some of them, but it's better to start again. No need. Okay. So briefly, I will show the history of bariatric surgery in Asian Pacific region. Bariatric surgery was started in Australia in 1962. Then intestinal bypass was performed in Taiwan in 1974. And Dr. Chen introduced vertical gastroplasty in 1981. In 1982, Dr. Kawamura, Japan, introduced Ruai gastric bypass, but two years later, he changed the main procedure into vertical banded gastroplasty due to gastric cancer problem. In 1990s, laparoscopic bariatric procedures were introduced in Asia Pacific region. This slide shows the start year of open and laparoscopic bariatric metabolic surgery. Australia and Taiwan started bariatric metabolic surgery before 1980, and Japan, China, Singapore, and Saudi Arabia began it in the 1980s. Laparoscopic procedures were started in Australia, Taiwan, and Saudi Arabia in 1990s, and Japan, China, and uh, India began them in 2000. According to the data of APMBSS and IFSO service between 2003 and 2004, annually, only 3,400 cases underwent bariatric metabolic surgery in Asia Pacific region. Outstandingly, in Australia, over 2,000 cases per year were performed. In, okay. in 2005, APMBSS created the guideline of indication of bariatric surgery which was obese patient with more than 37 BMI or more than 32 BMI with diabetes or other two obesity related comorbidities. Because Asian people has obesity related comorbidities at lower BMI compared to Western people. The indications have been generalized to Asian regions as standard criteria. 
Afterward, if the Asia Pacific chapter, if the APC was founded in 2008 and the second Congress of if the APC was held in 2011 in, in Japan, Hokkaido, Rus, this Congress program included a consensus meeting for indications for bariatric and metabolic surgery and national report session attempted first in the if the APC. As a result, of the con uh, consensus meeting, new surgical indications for uh, Asian patients have been announced. The indication of bariatric surgery was more than 35 BMI, and the indication of metabolic surgery was more than 30 BMI with inadequately controlled type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. According to the data of IFSA survey and the IFSA APC 2011 national report, between 2010 and 2011, annually, 32,000 cases underwent bariatric metabolic surgery in Asia, Asia Pacific region. The number increased by more than nine holes compared to that between 2003 and 2004. In addition, in 2016, DSS2 guidelines recommended metabolic surgery for Asian patient with more than 37.5 BMI, regardless of the level of glycemic control, and with 32.5 32, 32 to 37.5 BMI and inadequately controlled hyperglycemia. Metabolic surgery should also be considered to be an option in patient with BMI 27.5 to 32.5 and inadequately controlled hyperglycemia. This slide shows Asian indications of bariatric and metabolic surgery. According to these guidelines, each Asia Pacific country and region has established on indications until now. This slide show, shows Asian indication of bariatric and metabolic surgery in each case and region. Excluding West Asian countries, the indication of bariatric surgery is now more than 35 to 37.5 BMI and the indication of metabolic surgery is more than 27.5 to 32 BMI with diabetes or other two comorbidities. In most of the Gulf countries, the indication of bariatric metabolic surgery is more than 40 BMI or more than 35 BMI with comorbidities. According to increase, in the number of bariatric metabolic surgery and expansion of indications of bariatric and metabolic surgery, bariatric metabolic surgeries have been covered by public health insurance or the reimbursement systems have been established in many Asia Pacific countries and regions until now. According to the data, APMBSS and IFSA surveys and IFSA APC 2021 uh, national reports between 2017 and 2019, annually over 126,000 cases underwent bariatric metabolic surgery in Asia Pacific region. The number increased by 3.9 holes compared to that between 2010 and 2011. This slide shows percentages of procedures in each country and region in 2017. Three gastrectomy accounted for more than half of the procedures except for Korea. However, in 2019, three gastrectomy accounted for 69% of the procedures in Korea. In 2017, in total, three gastrectomy accounted for 68% of the procedures, bypass surgery accounted for 20% 20, 20 and others accounted for 12%. Also now we can use data of 13 if the APC countries and regions between 2019 and 2020. 
total cases of bariatric metabolic surgery decreased by 25% due to the impact of COVID-19 in South and Southeast Asia. Current problems and the future perspective in Asia Pacific countries and the regions are insurance coverage and the medical funding system, lack of awareness and comprehension among the physicians and the general public, still small number of cases and training system and the standardization of procedures. In conclusion, bariatric metabolic surgery has rapidly grown in the Asia Pacific region, primarily due to the expansion of surgical criteria and establishment of public health insurance and the investment systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Walter. And uh, your lecture is amazing. And um... I, I'm sorry, my, my, maybe, uh, my video voice is uh, loudy. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, the, but it's okay that the, after that, I can I can hear you very clearly, and we can understand that the number of the bariatric metabolic surgery in our region is rapidly growing, growing, and it's really a very important procedures in our region. And then, so I would like to ask next speakers. So. Thank you, Doctor. We... <clears throat> Thank you so much. Ka oh, Kazu, yeah, can... I'm here. Can... Thank you I'm for back, coming. But I can, I cannot turn my video on. Can you just uh, ask if Emma can hear us? Can just turn my video on, and I would like to ask some questions to Masayuki. Uh, are you going to have the questions at the end, or can we ask the question now? Yeah, usually you have a question and a discussion at the end. Okay, fine. I will wait then. Yeah, that's okay. great. Okay, so that we we will go to the next speaker. Is it okay? That's fine. Yeah. Thank you, my here. So the next speaker is Dr. Yosuke Seki, and he will talk about the cost effectiveness. I think it's a very important issue in our field of bariatric metabolic surgery. The please start. Your presentation, Dr. Seki. Uh, uh, good evening, and uh, Dr. Kasama and Dr. Lomant and all the organizing person. And the <clears throat> my talk is about the cost effectiveness of bariatric surgery. It's an uh, I prepared a video, so it's, can you please play the video? It's an I hope that there is no technical problem during my presentation. And the <clears throat> my talk is about the cost I'm effectiveness Dr. of bariatric surgery. It's an, uh, I prepared a video. So it's can you please play the video? It's an, I hope that there is no technical problem during my presentation. My, and the, my, talk my talk is about the cost, cost effectiveness of bariatric surgery. It's an, uh, I prepared a video. So can you please play the video? It's an, I hope that there is no technical problem during my presentation. And the... My talk, my talk today is about a couple of years ago in the before the yes. Corona crisis. Yes, we organized the AP. It is an echo. Yeah, it's, um, it's an echo. I think it's your, your microphone. Yes, it is an echo. Yeah, it's, um, it's an echo. I think it's your microphone. Yes, it's an echoing. I think it's your table shows the indications of bariatric metabolic surgery in each Asian country as well as in the status of public health insurance. As you see, the guidelines proposed by the Academic Society of Bariatric Insurance Coverage the each by the policy makers are not always seen. No, 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 no. I just, I just sent my video to Emma. It's an, I, so I don't do anything. I don't do anything. It's an, I just sent my video. It's an, I, I, I think it's better to do it library, just like a. Okay, time. okay. Okay. Is the video okay? Try, try again, Emma. 
Try it again, Emma. No, I think it's better to share it your screen. Okay. In the Western again, world, Emma. there are many studies again, on the Emma. economic impact of bariatric surgery. Emma, no, can you to Emma refer to screen. the return okay. on the investment? Emma, can you please can you play my video from, from, the, point point from the beginning? Hours. There are many studies right again, Emma. from the beginning. No, no. Sure, that is still echoing. Emma, can you please or can you play my video from the, point point from the beginning? Hours. There are many studies right again, Emma. from the beginning. No, no. Good evening. I'm sure Dr. Seki from Yatsuya Medical Care in Tokyo, Japan. On the investment. Uh, Yoseki, it is better for you to do live presentation. Video sure. is echoing all the time. Sure. Okay, so just wait. This is our case mix disclosure. Uh, Yoseki, it is better for you to A do live of years presentation. Ago in 2018, is all the time. before the sure. Corona crisis. Okay, so we organized the APMBS's meeting in case Tokyo. mix disclosure. And we uh, surveyed and asked the representative areas yeah, I will, I, from yeah, the I will do that. Asian countries about the current support. Okay, so we organized the APMBS's meeting case of disclosure. And many of them surveyed and asked about the lack of insurance. Yeah, I will do that. Yeah, I will do that. Asian training system, the current standardization areas, the lack of awareness and comprehension. So, Emma, can you please stop my video? And then I will share my slide, okay? Yeah, that's better. Please set your presentation on live. Yeah. Yeah, that's my Yes, better. I stop. Yes. Okay. Okay, so it's in my talk is about the cost effectiveness of Asian bariatric metabolic surgery. Okay. Can you hear? This is yes, my yeah, and this is our case mix disclosure. A couple of years ago. Uh, in 2018, before the corona crisis, we organized the APMBSS meeting in Tokyo, and we surveyed and asked the representative uh, bariatric uh, surgeons from all Asian countries about the current problems on bariatric metabolic surgery in each countries, and many of them pointed out the lack of public insurance coverage, followed by training system, the standardization of the procedures, lack of awareness and comprehension, among physicians and the general public and national registry and etc. So this table shows the indication of bariatric metabolic surgery in each Asian countries, as well as the status of public health insurance. As you see, the guidelines proposed by the academic societies and the insurance coverage determined by the policymakers are not always the same. So in real world settings, a crucial factor influencing whether a certain treatment is popularized is coverage of the treatment by health insurance, either private or public, whichever, not on how the treatment is described in guidelines. This is what is called the five EVMs. We doctors as scientists put much weight on evidence-based medicine in the middle, but again, in the real world, Many things are determined based on another EBM, which is the economy-based medicine. In the Western world, there are many, many studies on the economic impact of bariatric surgery. Return on investment or cost break even point in other words. The key point are the initial investment for bariatric surgery is approximately 26,000 US dollars for open surgery and 70,000 US dollars for laparoscopic surgery. And the initial investment is returned within four years for patients who undergo open surgery and within two years for patients undergoing laparoscopic surgery. Among the American Diabetes Association recommended interventions, Bariatric surgery in individuals with type 2 diabetes mellitus and obesity was categorized as cost saving, more health benefit at a lower cost compared with no bariatric surgery. But 
the cost effectiveness in a certain country needs to be validated separately under their own healthcare system as it differs significantly from country to country. In this study from our center, we investigated the long-term impact of laparoscopic sleep in severely obese patients with diabetes on drug cost. Laparoscopic sleep is the most common type of bariatric surgery in Japan and in the world as well. And it is the only procedure covered by national health insurance here in Japan. In this study, 230 severely obese patients with type 2 diabetes undergoing sleep gastrectomy are enrolled. Preoperative body weight and BMI 115 kilogram and 40.6 respectively, and followed up up to five years. This shows the changes in body weight, BMI, and the remission of metabolic syndrome after five years in our cohort. Like other reports from Asia, sleep provides quite good control metabolic syndrome in severely obese patients with good durability. As for drug cost for diabetes, median drug cost before surgery was 3,800 Japanese yen per month and it decreased significantly to zero at one year and up to five years. As for drug cost for hypertension, median drug cost before surgery was 3,000 Japanese yen, and it decreased significantly to zero at one and three years and 700 Japanese yen at five years. And this lipidemia, median drug cost before surgery was 1,000 400 Japanese yen, and it decreased significantly to zero at one year and up to five years. So we found that from the perspective of patients' financial burden, the cost of laparoscopic sleeve operation corresponds to 4.75 years of median drug cost to treat type 2 diabetes and hypertension. And laparoscopic sleeve is effective both physically and cost-wise for patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. In this prospective study, we apply sleep DJP to inadequately controlled type 2 diabetics with non-severely obese Japanese patients. 56 patients who fulfill all these inclusion criteria were initially screened and assessed by a diabetes specialist whether or not the optimal medical management for diabetes had been reasonably provided, and 50% then were excluded. The remaining 28 patients were considered to be inadequately, truly inadequately controlled, and after four weeks of preoperative weight loss program, sleep DJP was performed. This is the change in hemoglobin A1C, as well as body weight after metabolic surgery, sleep DJP. Diabetes remission was achieved in 23% of the patients and good glycemic control of A1C, less than 7% was achieved in 54%. On the contrary, poor control of A1C, more than 8%, decreased from 61% to 8% at one year. Significant quality of life improvement was observed at all the domains except for raw emotional, you can see that one year after surge, metabolic surgery, the quality of life of the patient is almost equivalent to the Japanese reference general population's quality of life. There was a significant reduction in the majority of medication used for glycemic control. For the patients who still require diabetes medication at one year after surgery, Bigranite and DPP4 inhibitor were the medication of choice. The usage of injectable agents like insulin or GLP-1 significantly reduced after surgery. On the contrary, the use of digestive agents such as PPIs increased. There was no impact on the use of psychiatric agents. So, Consequently, the average cost of diabetes medication per patient per month significantly decreased from 
14,000 Japanese yen the baseline to 2,500 Japanese yen at one year, which is the 82% reduction. When all medications were included in analysis, the average cost became 24,000 Japanese yen at baseline and 8,000 Japanese yen at one year, which was a 67% reduction. And in this propensity score matched retrospective analysis, we compared bariatric metabolic surgery and conventional medical treatment, focusing on clinical as well as financial impact. The study included 78 patients undergoing either sleep or sleep DJB at our center, whose BMI between 27.5 to 35, and 238 patients in the medical treatment group whose data were derived from the Japanese Medical Data Center claim database. Each patient was propensity score matched between the bariatric surgery and the medical treatment group by age, sex, BMI, hemoglobin, A1C, and type 2 diabetes duration, and compared from the index day to the one year post index. Primary outcome measure was diabetes remission at one year post index, and secondly, measures included these uh, on the screen. So the diabetes remission rate at one year was 59.0% in the bariatric surgery group and 0.4% in the medical treatment group. And optimal glycemic controlled A1C less than 7% was achieved in 75.6% in the surgery group and in 29% in the medical group. At the one year post index date, the bariatric surgery group included 75.6% of the patients without drug treatment versus the medical treatment, which included 90% of them receiving overall medication. Significant hemoglobin A1C reduction by 1.6% was achieved in the surgery group, while minimal impact in the medical arm. BMI drop by 7.5 unit was achieved in the surgery group, and again, minimal change in the medical arm. Besides significant improvement regarding blood pressure, lipid profile, and cardiovascular risk were observed only in the surgical arm. Consequently, the median monthly drug cost for metabolic syndrome decreased from 126 US dollars at baseline to zero in the bariatric surgery group, whereas it increased from 52 US dollars to 58 US dollars in the medical treatment group. This is another propensity score matched analysis from our Hong Kong colleagues. They analyzed medical expense in more comprehensive manner with long-term follow-up. According to their analysis, the five-year cumulative cost incurred by surgical patients were higher compared to the control. And bariatric surgery in obese patients with type 2 diabetes is expensive, but leads to an improved comorbidity profile and reduced length of hospitalization. And colleagues from Thailand, published more sophisticated simulation analysis, such as Markov model. Please do not ask about these difficult terminology like an, an quality and ICER. But anyway, uh, the incremental cost for quality, quality of just life years of bariatric surgery compared with the medication control is 26,000 Thai bars per quality, which can consider bariatric surgery as a cost-effective option and use of bariatric surgery morbidly obese with type 2 diabetes patients is a cost-effective strategy in Thailand context. And I've heard this analysis greatly contributed to their recent establishment of insurance coverage of bariatric surgery in Thailand. This is another cost-effective analysis from our Chinese colleagues. The total healthcare cost decreased sharply from the second year because in the first year, the it's an operation fee costs. 
and after ruin like us to bypass and maintain for three years. And in the medical treatment group, the total healthcare cost changed without significance. Gastric bypass cost US 19,000 per quality gain compared to medical treatment, which was lower than a willingness to pay of 20,000 per quality. So compared to medical treatment, Renoir gastric bypass is cost effective for Chinese patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity four years after the operation. Korean insurance coverage policy is, I believe, one of the best ones. They cover all kinds of procedures for the patients with BMI more than 30 with comorbidity. And besides, BMI over 27.5 with poorly controlled diabetes patients were partially covered as well. To convince the policymaker in Korea, our Korean colleagues conducted careful and sophisticated cost-effective analysis and approved the following. That is, bariatric surgery improved qualities and was the cost-effective option in total cohort. It was shown to be cost-effective in all subgroup analysis based on BMI level. In particular, bariatric surgery was a dominant alternative for the subgroup with basal BMI of 35 to 37.5. And bariatric surgery at BMI of more than 30 was more effective than non-surgical treatment for a reduction in BMI and a remission of obesity related to comorbidities and was cost-effective in Korea. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, Bariatric metabolic surgery seems to be a cost-effective treatment in the Asian setting as well. But in the real world, a crucial factor influencing whether a certain treatment is popularized is coverage of the treatment by health insurance rather than how the treatment is described in guidelines. Cost-effective analysis is essential to convince policymakers. Thank you very much for listening. And I really, really looking forward to all the Asian colleagues to uh, see in person in the very near future. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you, Dr. Saiki. Thank you. Thank you. Kazu, it's, uh, you can, yeah, you can talk on. Okay. So that I would like to pass my, my, my microphone to Dr. Mahir Osman from Turkey to introduce the persons from Elsa side. So. Okay, thank talk. you very much. We have, uh, we had two great uh, lectures and probably we will have all the questions at the end. Uh, we, today we are going to have two speakers from the Elsa side. One of them is actually Arun Prasad. He's currently in England and he is having difficulties in connecting uh, to the webinar. Uh, therefore, probably we will have uh, only one uh, lecture and then we can have a discussion together. Uh, our speaker is uh, Asim Sabir. Asim is a senior consultant and associate professor in the uh, National University of Singapore. And he's mainly interested in the uh, upper GI surgery, surgical oncology and bariatric metabolic surgery. He is uh, doing a lot of laparoscopic and robotic procedures. And today he is going to uh, give us a lecture on the long-term survival after bariatric and metabolic surgery. I would like to uh, leave this stage to Asim. Asim, are you here? Yes, Dr. Mahir. Uh... Okay. Great, yeah, you can carry on now. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, it is clearly seen. And, okay. yeah. Thank you very much, Mahir and Kasama, uh, for this kind invitation. Um, thank you for JSS and Elsa for inviting me. Uh, I'm to speak on the long-term survival after bariatric surgery. So let's carry on. That's a small brief introduction of mine. If you look at the uh, Journal of American of Cardiology, uh, we can clearly see uh, from this published data that uh, metabolic issues related to obesity are on the rise and so is death. And 
we are losing a lot of valuable resources to morbid obesity. And you can see that as time passes by, uh, the rate of obesity globally, the burden of obesity is increasing. Uh, with the increase of obesity, uh, paralleling it is the increase in metabolic diseases. And you can see here clearly from 2019, there will be about 463 million diabetics globally, whereas in 2020-45, we anticipate these numbers will go up to 700 million uh, diabetes globally. So there is a perpetual increase, not in the, only the obesity, but also of metabolic diseases. Thus, there is an intense need for us uh, to basically treat both these uh, diseases together. And what really it is, it's about quality of life, reducing morbidity, mortality associated with these diseases. We know we have bariatric surgery. Uh, a lot of studies, uh, randomized control trials have been published to show that metabolic surgery is actually more effective than conventional medical therapy uh, in the long-term control of type 2 diabetes. And this over time, uh, it's only again and been again proven surgery to be one of the best tools. Over time, what we do notice is that uh, medical intervention arms, their newer drug like semaglutide and all this, and they're getting more and more important over time uh, in the field. Uh, but still to date, surgery stands as one of the key important modalities. The first question when we talk about reducing and improving survival is, does surgery actually, is surgery in its own safe? And if you look at this pooled analysis that was published some time back uh, from the University of at Oxford in the meta-analysis and published in the British Journal of Surgery, the pooled perioperative mortality within 30 days of bariatric surgery is 0.08%. That means uh, of the 4,356 studies, out of which 58 were included, there were only 4,707 deaths in the bariatric surgery cohort uh, out of 3650961 total patients. Now, does this mortality vary with the kind of surgeries we do? And is the survival or mortality rates different? Uh, it is certainly different. And again, uh, published in the British Journal of Surgery, you can see LAGB had a mortality of 0 0.03. Sleeve standing at 0 0.05, bypass at 0 0.09, OAGB similar to the bypass and BPDS at 0 0.45. And this, these mortalities from these procedures are almost equal to any other procedure that you could perform, even to the extent that it is comparable to the mortality of doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now, if you look at published observational studies, which include some of the Swedish obesity group studies, uh, the other uh, studies, they all have shown uh, that basically uh, there is a decrease and there is a benefit of bariatric surgery in the long term in these patients, no matter whatever uh, procedure we do. And these are observational evidence supporting that bariatric surgery is superior to long term medical therapy. Let's take the example of the SOS study, the Swedish Obesity Study Group, which is one of the biggest and longest follow-up studies. And you can see from the graphs uh, that basically surgery outplays the uh, life arm where the, life, uh, the lifestyle intervention and the mortality reduction is considerable. However, one clear message that these studies give us is the fact that although there's a decrease in mortality from bariatric surgery, from lifestyle intervention, anyhow, the overall mortality of patients who are morbidly obese still remains higher as compared to those who have gone through either lifestyle modification or surgery. So still there is a need to work very hard on these aspects. The Cleveland data are clearly showing uh, the diversity and showing that all cause mortality is reduced in patients who go through metabolic surgery and reported at 10% here. The French study again showing the same numbers, uh, showing uh, 
distract me. Uh, procedure specific outcomes that you can see. Uh, mortality, overall survival, much more better in the sleep distract me group uh, versus the no here, the sleep distract me uh, group having a much better survival than the control group and here as well. If you look at uh, different meta-analysis and cohort studies in these uh, groups, sorry, just give me one minute, let me get rid of my screen. Just give me one minute, sorry. So if you look at this meta-analysis uh, and a systematic review published in obesity surgery in 2020, the median age group of this cohort was 37 years. Uh, compared to control patients who underwent bariatric surgery actually had a reduced long-term global mortality uh, for this median age group. So it is very hard to take and follow up these patients for 50 years and give you exact mortality of these patients. However, there was low overall mortality for persons with obesity of young age compared to those with who were elderly in this systematic review. Does bariatric surgery then prevent disease process from happening? Uh, there were 18 uh, studies included in this article, again, published somewhere in the 2020, I think, if I'm not wrong, um, with 539,904 patients with a minimum of uh, one and a half years follow-up. Um, All-cause mortality reduced, cardiovascular mortality reduced in this cohort of patients. Moreover, the incidence of emergence of diabetes decreased hypertension, dyslipidemia, and ischemic heart disease following surgery was much more. However, when we talk about survival, we should also talk about what's not so good about bariatric surgery. Uh, out of 7,925 published studies, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, of uh, 7,925 bariatric surgery patients in the general population comparison, mean follow-up of 7.1 years, the adjusted long-term overall cause mortality decreased by 40% in the surgical group compared with the control. So again, you see an improvement in survival for coming from uh, morbidities like cardiovascular events, diabetes, and cancer. However, there was slightly higher rate of accidents, suicide, and increased in the surgical group as compared to usual cohort. This study was by Adam, published in 2007. Again, another study talking about uh, prevalence of all-cause mortality and suicide. They analyzed 36 studies uh, where from the 28 studies, they were able to analyze the suicide rate, which come, came to about 4.1 over 10,000 person years in this population, so which was higher the average pool percentage of suicide after bariatric surgery is 0.3%. So one must bear in mind that psychiatric patients or patients who may not be able to handle uh, the change in body image, the trauma, their psychological aspects uh, may actually suffer from uh, issues that can potentially uh, bring them to suicide. But the incidence, fortunately, is low. It stands at 0 0.3%. Uh, if we look at this uh, study that was published in Diabetes Care, uh, it also favors for those with diabetes uh, bariatric surgery. This is the DSS, and it, it was an analysis of all the RCTs only, and you can see it again. If you look at level one evidence, this is the best level one evidence that you can get. It favors surgery, whether that is below or above 35. Based on this, at the National University Hospital, we decided to take our own study up. We wanted to show whether there was association of metabolic bariatric surgery with long-term survival in adults with or without diabetes. Uh, we published this study in Lancet. Why did we, uh, what did we study? We studied um, surgery versus usual care. Here, usual care is not only lifestyle modification, it included medications and endoscopic interventions. It included one Asian study, which was from Hong Kong, and uh, we compared these two. 
and we compared them for mortality, for gain in life expectancy, comparison between obese and non-obese, uh, obese and obese diabetics, and how numbers needed to treat to see what benefit we could get. If you look at this one stage meta-analysis, uh, is a single model fitted directly using the results of each study. This is called IPDMA sort of meta-analysis. We were clearly able to show that as time passed by, there were fewer mortalities. At 30 years, 29.5% uh, in the surgical arm were lost, whereas 46% in the surgical arm were lost uh, due to various comorbidities or uh, other issues and this was the mortality uh, at 30 years comparison. Now it would require firstly a very large number of patients to statistically demonstrate when the risk of mortality as we saw was 0.08 percent and if you our baseline population is 40 to 50 percent where the penetration or where the actual mortality even in the healthy population is very low that's why large numbers would be required, which was not something that can be easily done in longitudinal follow-up. So we use this IPDM, uh, IPDMA technique to basically extrapolate mortality, comparing metabolic bariatric surgery versus usual care. We compared all cause mortality, extrapolated life expectancy, uh, calculated numbers needed to treat obese patients with and without diabetes. So of all these studies, in the end, we actually included 17 studies in the meta-analysis. And we basically uh, use this meta-analysis to, uh, uh, to do our business. Right, so basically what we do is we basically take up a study, for example, the SOS study, we deconstruct the data. Uh, this is a standard way of deconstructing the data. So you borrow their Kaplan-Meier curves. So like this, you borrow their Kaplan-Meier curves in surgery versus control, deconstruct the data into numerical values. Each numerical value is then reconstru reconstructed and represents one patient. So this is the original graph by Riggs in 2018, and this is how we have reconstructed the data and, uh, and replotted it. And when you compare this data, it is matched. This data is matched to minimize confounding and ensure fair comparison. What we matched were age, gender, BMI, comorbidities, details of procedure, and usual care. One matched. We will compare the two graphs again and make sure that they are in order. You receive multiple graphs like this, and then you combine and extrapolate with that whole survival. And the analysis is a pooled analysis here. And you use the Gompetz uh, proportional hazard regression model to extrapolate this. And this is, you can see a representation of that extrapolation, and it is actually well represented and is comparable to the original presentation. Then we use this formula to cal calculate the numbers needed to treat. The numbers needed to treat gives you the number of people you will need to treat in order to prevent one additional bad outcome in comparison to the control group. And the smaller this number, the better it is. So in the study population, we had 174,772 patients with a maximum follow-up of 30 years. Uh, and a median follow-up of 69.4 months. Most participants in this study were between 40 to 50 years of age, and thus these findings are mostly applicable to this age group. So the overall mortality favors the surgical intervention, as you can see here very clearly. Our overall mortality decreased in the surgical cohort, which was 29.5%, whereas it was 46% in the non-surgical cohort control treatment. So over 30 years. And what you can see is that you can see the graph widening as time passes by. Initially, the graphs are closed at one, two years, where even uh, non-surgical intervention might be better. But over time, surgery proves its efficacy in decreasing.
the median life expectancy was 6.1 years longer in the metabolic bariatric surgery group compared to usual care. The numbers needed to prevent one additional death at 10 years follow-up was 24 patients. So we needed to treat 24 patients uh, to prevent one death at 10 years. And we needed to treat 10.8 patients at 20 years to prevent one additional death. However, if we break down and do a subgroup analysis in patients without diabetes and mortality, the, re uh, the reduction uh, of death risk was 29.4% only. Still significant, that means we are going to save about one third of these patients. But when we do this uh, for patients who are just obese, the median gain in life is about 5.1 years and you need to treat about 30 patients. So for every 100 patients who are morbidly obese and are 40 years and above who have obesity without diabetes, approximately 88 patients will live beyond 10 years if they receive usual care, whereas 92 patients will live beyond 10 years if they receive bariatric surgery. So considerable difference. However, a more striking difference was noted in patients who were obese with diabetes and the re relative reduction in death was close to 60% in this cohort. The median years of gain in life was 9.3% and you only needed to treat 8 patients with diabetes to prevent one death at 10 years. Again, 79 patients were expected if they were obese and diabetes to live 10 years if they received usual care. However, 91 patients could live out of 100 at 10 years if they were treated with bariatric surgery. So uh, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Mingron had put it, basically, these are the years of life that diabetes had stolen from this patient, that obesity had... Obesity had stolen from these patients that we have now given it back to them by just doing a surgical intervention. When we looked at procedures <coughs> and compared LAGB, RYGB, LSG, they, the relative risk reduction of death was similar. 57.6% for bypass, 50% for bands. For sleeve, 51.9%, no difference in relative reduction of death. No difference in the outcome, survival outcomes between procedures as well. Maybe the numbers are small, small. Some, of the some of the data is old and some procedures are now not also valid. But however, we found no difference in the outcomes and they were compar comparable across all bariatric groups. We all know that currently the impact of uh, the, the option that we have to offer bariatric surgery to our patients is there. But uh, of the 184 million people worldwide that are severely obese, the uh, uptake of metabolic surgery is less than uh, 1%. Assuming that out of 184, 30% are eligible, which gives us a cohort of 55.2 million with diabetes, if we increase the penetration of bariatric surgery by 1%, uh, the years in those who will be with diabetes gained will be 5133600 potential life years gain. And as the numbers increase, there was a huge gain in the life years that they would gain. That is, the years they would be spending their life being productive were much more than those who did not have diabetes. In summary, uh, surgery, uh, basically cohort at long term, uh, 10 years, 96.6 patients were alive. Non-surgery group, 91.5. When you reach 30 years in the surgery cohort, 60.5% patients alive versus non-surgery cohort or usual care, 54 patients alive. When we look at and separate them based on diabetes versus no diabetes, 
you can see that the gain in life expectancy for the diabetes patients with obesity is 9.3 years compared to 5.1 years in the non-diabetic cohort. And mortality reduction is 60% compared to 30% in the non-diabetic. You need an extremely small number of patients to show this improvement in diabetic patients with obesity, which is 8.4% versus non-diabetes, which is 29.8% so with 28.9 patients requiring a high number of uh, interventions. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. If there would be questions for me, I would be happy to take them. Thank you, Asim. That was a great presentation and that was quite timely. And Kazu, I believe we will have the questions for all speakers in the same time as Arun Prasad uh, couldn't make it uh, to join and make his presentation to us. So if there is any question, uh, then we can have. Uh, Otherwise, I will have questions for the Japanese uh, friends. Um, are you actually thinking that the, um, based on the BMI of the uh, ASEAN people, we should choose the procedure or we should decide the uh, uh, comorbid disease and the rate of the adipose tissue and the obesity of the patient while we are choosing the procedures? This is the first question. And the second question is, what do you think about the MGB uh, in Japan? Is it very common as compared to other part of ASEAN countries like uh, India and Thailand, uh, even in Turkey? I don't know. I would like to have your, your opinion on that as well. Okay, so that the first question is go to Dr. Other. Last question. <laughs> Uh, so according to the, not only the BMI, so we decide the procedures uh, by the BMI and uh, uh, comorbidities, especially type two diabetes. Especially type two diabetes, diabetes severity is very important to choose uh, three gastrectomy or bypass surgery. If the uh, severe diabetes exists at the time, uh, we will use, uh, we will uh, choose uh, uh, three DJV. It's usual in Japan, I think. If you have a patient with the uh, BMI of 40, but fat rate, adipose tissue rate is around 25%. So mostly it's coming from the muscle uh, load. Are you going to operate on that patient based on BMI or because what I'm trying to do is BMI is an ill-definition, uh, ill-defined uh, way of uh, deciding obesity. I think we should discuss on that and the obesity should based on the rate of adipose tissue uh, rather than the uh, rate of BMI because if you look at the ASEAN people, uh, you can say that, yes, BMI is low, but if you look at the actual fat rate, it should be same as compared to other uh, part of the world. It's not so easy to uh, respond uh, uh, question, I think, because uh, usually we decide uh, uh, operation, uh, to, according to the BMI, not the adipose tissue rate, I think. But uh, we usually uh, measure uh, uh, adipose tissue rate also. So how do you think, uh, Dr. Uh, Kasama? Thank you, Dr. Ota. Thank you, Dr. Mahir. Actually, that uh, BMI is so-called old fashioned but very easy to calculate. So that uh, I agree with what Mahir said, we need to calculate and we need to decide with uh, uh, fat ratio or other factors. But BMI is just a very easy cutoff point, you know? So that we, 
basically use a BMI, you know that you know the history of bariatric surgery. In 1991, the American society decided to use the BMI as an indication of surgery. From that point, we always use a BMI as one of the indications. But uh, as I said, it's uh, old fashioned. So that, of course, we need to change in the more detail the indication, but still not clear yet. I think it's our future to decide. Asim, uh, do you have anything to say on that as well? On uh, Asian BMI and um, outcomes? Uh, patient BMI and the decision of surgery based on BMI or the it, whether it should based on the rate of the adipose tissue rather than BMI only. So the, the problem with all these indicators is they do have um, they do have their downsides as well. So we have to use something. We don't have the ideal indicator. Now, can we use multiple indicators, group them and assess them? Uh, it's, we're still far away from them. There will come a time like, you know, the Cleveland calculator is available. You key in your BMI, your CA peptide and this, and it will tell you that out of this, your chances of remission of diabetes, relapse of diabetes is this, but then again, I hope that in time, we'll be able to talk to patients and predict using these predictive models and telling them that, look, the chances that you do a sleeve gastrectomy, uh, that you will lose 20% of excess weight is 100% but losing 100% excess weight is 10%, but with the sleeve, your chances of remission of diabetes is 20%, whereas with the bypass is 46%, but your quality of life will be better with the sleeve as compared to this, based on this data, and that will be a game changer. But we are far from that, and I think till that comes, we will have to rely on what the global norm does, and uh, as we all know, economy drives what we do. So the insurers will continue to use BMI because that is something they can easily collect and yeah. we will have to fall in line and in order with that. So it may be not the most ideal tool for us, uh, but it is what is uh, best uh, in, of the best uh, interest of all the partners. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also have one question to Yosuke, and he says the cost, I mean, the metabolic surgery in Asia is cost effective. Uh, when you compare the procedures uh, based uh, cost, I mean, MGB uh, compared to sleeve, compared to uh, SADI procedures, uh, which one of them do you think is, is better and costly? for controlling the uh, diabetes? Um, it's a very difficult question as well. And it's an, uh, <clears throat> I couldn't find, uh, I, could, I could only uh, one um, cost effectiveness paper from the Asia comparing the procedures. It's an, I think it, it's a paper from the China Chinese group comparing the sleeve and the ruin y gastric bypass in mm -hmm. terms of the cost effectiveness and their conclusion is a sl sleeve is more cost effective. And it's an, I also found the another uh, comparative paper from the Western countries and uh, also comparing the sleeve and a bypass and it's an, uh, they conclude that ruin y gastric bypass is most cost effective because it's an, uh, the gastric bypass controls the diabetes better. Uh, so I think it's, and there's no conclusion, um, but it's, an, I think it's, um, as I um, listened to the ASIM presentations, and I think it's, um, the, my, my, my opinion is the procedure itself do not matter. And it's, uh, I think the, it's a uh, weight loss, uh, whatever the procedure and the weight loss uh, uh, matters, um, more, it's, 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 it's my, just my opinion. I mean, you're right. I mean, for the short, yeah. I, I add to Seki's comments. So you see, it is exactly how you do your cost effective studies. 
right? So if you look at the initial leak rates, complication rates for sleep are lower, but over time revision rates will be more. If you add to all those costs, then probably sleep will match bypass because the initial complication rates of bypass are also low, but as time passes by a re-intervention and those who have a re-intervention for whatever tend to have more and more re-interventions. Um, but then again, for medical therapy, it's not any different. Uh, because today you start with metformin, you go to glipizide, then you go to cystagliptins, and then you go and you just keep climbing the ladder and the cost keeps climbing. And then you, again, then you don't add whether, oh, this patient is taking diabetes medicines with hypertension and the hypertension is the complication of the diabetes or not, or what is it due to, correct? So... A lot of nuances in doing these cost analysis. Uh, and as I showed that over time, it seems for an individual, if I'm an individual and I think of surgery, uh, there is a 0.08% chance that at 30 years, um, I would have died from surgery. Whereas there is a good 39% chance compared to medical therapy, I would be alive productive without complications. So it is how we frame uh, our answer to the patient that makes that difference. Thank you. Yeah, it's an, I just I, I just add one thing, it's an, you know, it's an, uh, it's an uh, many of the cost effective study in the literature, um, they adopt the it's an, a simulation model. It's an, a, based on the it's an, a, just an, a one year or two years outcome after surgery. So it's an, uh, so they hypothesized this outcome they get uh, throughout the one year, the two years after surgery, it's an, uh, they hypothesize that this status lasts forever, right? So it's, uh, I think it's, an, uh, this is the, it's, an, uh, it's an, a very serious, important uh, limitation of this and this kind of cost-effective study. It's, I agree. The, that kind of studies should be done for a short-term period, as Asim and you said, and also for the long-term follow-up. When you look at the long terms, uh, most of the sleeve uh, will actually fail in controlling the diabetes as well, because most of the patient will, will put some weight on. Uh, the uh, last question I will ask to, to Asim is the... When you look at the uh, long-term survival of the bariatric uh, metabolic surgery uh, in patients, uh, you are actually checking the um, effect of controlling the comorbid disease rather than the procedure itself. And if you look at the uh, physiological and metabolic changes uh, due to the procedure itself, uh, for example, malnutrition and all that stuff, and the procedure itself actually has some problem for the long-term survival of the patient. What do you think of that as well? Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. So it is at which point in time do we get these patients? Are we really treating the right cohort of patients? And are we analyzing them in that detail. You know, I can say if I treat a, if you look at the cost effectiveness study that was, pre, uh, that was published by the SOS group, okay. they Best looked at those patients who actually had uh, pre-diabetes diabetes and mature diabetes. Uh -huh. And they found that those with early diabetes were the best patients to be treated. Why? Because if you treat it, you keep your glycemic control under six, the risk that they will have any complications for diabetes is much lower. But naturally, nature would still take its toll because it's a pathological procedure. It's a pathological process. There will be mortalities and morbidities due to unjust interventions. You know, what I call cowboy interventions. You know, I can do this. Just because you can do this doesn't mean that yeah, it is good that, for the patient, yeah, well, right? So we have to be very, exactly. you can do these kind of work in experimental work and follow up and show. But just because you can do something doesn't mean that that something is very effective, right? Like Kasama and team put up sleeve DJB. They have long-term follow-up data to back it. And now the journal people can follow that data if they wish to have it. So I think uh, in order to keep uh, some same in the procedure, uh, we need to have some guidelines. And that's why organizations like IFSO, uh, like ASMBS 
approve procedures because there is enough data for this. Yeah, thank you, Mahir. Great, Kazu, do you have any question for the speakers? No, actually that uh, in this webinar, we have learned a lot from Asim and the Yosuke and the Dr. Ota regarding the situation in Asia and also the cost effectiveness and the long-term survival ratio. So that I would like to ask the, all the colleagues who joined this webinar to encourage your physician and the patient using this data. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So that the cost and the long survival is a very important to our patient. So that uh, still many physicians don't know much about the surgery and they still think the surgery is a very risky. So that, and uh, I want all the participants here to convince them that the surgery is much better than the medical care cost and uh, also the, the survival rate of the medical care. So we can conclude from this webinar that uh, wherever you are, it doesn't matter whether we are in the United States, in Europe or in Asia, if your patient gets the proper bariatric metabolic surgery, chance of uh, survival is definitely uh, better than uh, medical treatment or without any kind of treatment. Uh, and also we can say that bariatric metabolic surgery is cost-effective procedure uh, in the short and the long term. And I will leave uh, leave uh, leave the microphone to you to do the closure of the uh, of the webinar. Yeah. Thank you, Mahir. So exactly this is the time we have uh, one and thirty one hour and thirty minutes of approved time. So that I think it's a very informative uh, webinar to all the panelists and all the audience. So I would like to appreciate the, all the speakers and uh, David, Emer, and especially our co-moderator Mahir. Thank you. Thank you so I much. Thank you. I also, yeah. I also thank, thank you, you and also all our speakers for joining us. And also Elsa will have a lot of uh, webinars in the future and hoping that uh, we will carry on with this and uh, we will discuss most important issues together. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, Yoseki. Thank you, Kazu. And thank you uh, for all speakers and uh, participants for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good time. And please join if so in this year. And the next year is in Turkey. Yeah. Elsa is in Turkey, yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mayer. Thank you. Thank you, Kazama. Thank you, Seki. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Asim. Bye -bye. Hope to see you. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Take care.